I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to share with you the wonderful news of Jesus the Messiah. In my absence and stepping out of the room for a couple of minutes, all my notes disappeared, but because this is a deep theme in my heart, I'm happy to speak without them. 23 years ago, I had no interest in God, let alone in believing in Jesus. I was shooting heroin, playing drums in a rock band. After my bar mitzvah, I went straight down. And really, it was only against my will, against my desires, against my pride, against my stubbornness, that I had an encounter with the love of God, that I found out that, you, that Jesus, Yeshua, was in fact the Jewish Messiah. Had a wonderful life-transforming experience, was turned away from all the things I was doing that I wanted to keep doing, but I knew they were sin in God's sight. I was wonderfully changed and delivered. My parents were thrilled to see the change, but they had one problem. Well, you uh, don't follow our traditions now. We want you to meet with the local rabbi. So in 1972, I met with the local rabbi. January 24th was our first meeting. He and I became fast friends. He encouraged me to study Hebrew. He said, look, I need to bring you to other Jews who are equally zealous, but they're right. So I began to dialogue with the Lubavitch Hasidim in Brooklyn, New York, ultra-Orthodox Jews. But the problem was the whole plan to get me to learn Hebrew and to study so as to convince me that what I believed was wrong, the whole plan backfired. Because the more I studied, the more I learned, the more I sought God, the more convinced I became. And if you're open, open to God, open to the scriptures, open to the truth, I believe you'll hear clear evidence that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah. In fact, the reason that we have had so many problems through the centuries as Jews, the reasons that we have been exiled from our land and our temple has not been rebuilt, is because when the Messiah came, we missed him. You say, that's a bold claim. Let me back it up. I do have some notes I just found here. What I want to say first is this. If you've ever read the Hebrew Bible, and that's really our, our source tonight, the Hebrew Scriptures, you know that it doesn't just stop in the middle and say, stop, this is a messianic prophecy. There's some literature that's being given out saying 20 telltale signs of the Messiah. But if you'll read the scriptures, you will see in no place does it say the Messiah will come and do this and this and this. In other words, you must interpret that these passages are messianic. Well, what does the word Messiah actually mean? It comes from the Hebrew Mashiach. And it is parallel to the Greek word Christos, which we translate as Christ. Messiah and Christ mean the same thing. They mean the anointed one. When you read the Hebrew Bible, who was it that was a Mashiach? Who was it that was anointed in Israel? You say, well, the king. The Messiah is to be a king. Yes, but that is only part of the story. The priest, the high priest, was also a Mashiach, an anointed one. Not only that, not only the king and the priest, but also the prophet was called anointed of the Lord. And when we go through the Hebrew Bible, we will see very clearly that Jesus came as a priest, and he will come again as a king, and he came as a prophet, and he fulfills the relevant prophecies of the Hebrew Bible that first had to be fulfilled. Let me say this. He was born where the prophet said he would be born. He was born when the prophets said he would be born. Do you know that the Hebrew Bible teaches that the Messiah had to come before the second temple was destroyed over 1900 years ago? Do you know that Jewish tradition points to the fact that the Jews were waiting for the Messiah to come at that time? He came where he was supposed to come. He came when he was supposed to come. Not only that, he lived the life he was supposed to live. He healed the sick and opened the blind eyes and reached out to the oppressed and the hurting. Not only that, he died the way the prophet said he would die. Not only that, he rose from the dead the way the prophet said he would. Not only that, he was rejected by his people Israel just as the prophet said. Not only that, he has been a light to the nation so that hundreds of millions of people around the world worship the God of Israel because of him. Not only that, he is gathering back his Jewish people to himself so that now around the world there are many tens of thousands of Jews just like me, some former rabbis, some ultra-Orthodox Jews that have come to find the Messiah, Jesus, Yeshua. And I want to open these things up to you point by point. Micah, the fifth chapter, tells us that he who will be ruler in Israel will come forth from Bethlehem. Is this a messianic prophecy? The ancient Jewish tradition, the ancient 
translation of the Hebrew Bible into the language of the people, which was then Aramaic, says this is a prophecy of King Messiah. The major medieval rabbis said this is a prophecy of King Messiah, and I will gladly give more documentation on any of these points from the Hebrew or from the rabbinic commentaries if there's any question on anything I'm saying. Not only that, the prophet Malachi, writing about 400 years before the time of Jesus, said that the Lord would send his messenger to the temple. The one that they were seeking would come to that temple that was destroyed over 1,900 years ago. The prophet Haggai, writing about 500 years before Jesus came into the world, said this, that God would make the glory of that temple greater than the glory of Solomon's temple. That first temple had the presence of God dwelling there. The second temple didn't. It. And God said the glory of the second temple would be greater than the glory of the first. And God would establish his peace there. Not only that, the prophet Daniel said that before the second temple was destroyed, that everlasting righteousness would be established and final atonement would be made and an anointed one, a Mashiach, would be cut off. Isn't it amazing? The Talmud also says that there were to be 2,000 years of desolation, namely from Adam to Abraham, and 2,000 years of Torah, of law, namely from Abraham to the Messiah, and then 2,000 years of the Messiah, which would have been beginning 2,000 years ago. The Talmud says, but because of our sins, these years have passed, and we've missed out. Friends, it's not that the Messiah did not come when the prophet said he would come. Rather, he came, and because he was missed and rejected by his people, all these tragic things have taken place. Not only that, the prophets told us that when the kingdom of God came, when this anointed one came, that the eyes of the blind would be opened that the, the lame would walk and leap and jump, and we read the accounts in the New Testament how the crowds came. You say, do we know that these things happen? Let me say, out of all ancient books written, that which is the best attested historically, that which has the most evidence backing it up historically, is not the Hebrew Bible, and it's not the great writings of the Greek and Latin authors, it is the New Testament. The crowds came because of the healings, the miracles, the wonderful things that he did, the wonderful things that he's still doing around the world today. But the Bible also had some very serious news. I have been asked, where does the Bible say that the Messiah will come twice? Where does the Bible say that there will be two comings? Well, it says in the prophet Isaiah in the end of the 52nd chapter, Behold, my servant will act wisely. He will be exalted, lifted up, and very high. The ancient rabbi said that this is a prophecy of the Messiah who will be more exalted than Abraham, higher than Moses, and more lifted up than the ministering angels. Yes, he will be highly exalted, but not only that, it then says, that just as many as were astonished as you, yes, his very appearance would be marred and destroyed beyond human semblance. He will be exalted, but first he will suffer. And the prophet went on to say this, Surely he's carried our pains. He's borne our griefs. But it says, we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. There's an interesting passage in the Zohar, the major book of Jewish mysticism in the section called Pinchas, where it says, why is it that sometimes a righteous man suffers, and it seems he is innocently suffering? And the answer given is this, that sometimes when God wants to bring healing to the world, he smites one just man, one righteous man, and through that healing comes to the world. And it says, how do we know that? From the very passage that I just read, it says, He was wounded for our transgressions. The idea of the Messiah's suffering is a Jewish concept. It is a biblical concept. He must first suffer before he is exalted. In a moment, I'll explain why. Not only, though, did the prophet say that he would suffer and be rejected by his own people, but remarkably, in one of the most incredible messianic prophecies in all of the Bible, the prophet Isaiah said in the 42nd chapter that God's servant would actually bring the light and word of God to the Gentiles, to the nations. 
I've been in India, I've been in Korea, I've been in Finland, I've been in Mexico, I've been in these countries from one end of the globe to the other and met people, former Hindus, former atheists, former Muslims, former terrorists, former gross sinners, former murderers, you name it. They have wonderfully come to love the God of Israel and pray for the people of Israel and had a miraculous conversion through Jesus the Messiah. What an awesome thing. If he's not the Messiah, someone's going to have to do better than that. If he's not the Messiah, someone's going to have to do better than bringing hundreds of millions of people into the knowledge of the God of Israel, turning from sin, turning from idols, to worship the one true God. You're going to have to do better than that. It says there in a prophecy that the ancient Aramaic Jewish translation said was a messianic prophecy. My servant, the Messiah, would be a light to the nations. And then when you get to Isaiah 49, remarkable. The servant of the Lord is identified as Israel. And then he is called to regather Israel back to God. You say, is the servant of the Lord Israel or not? He is ideal Israel. Let me explain. When you have the Olympics and a man from America wins the medal, you read in the newspaper, America won a medal. And he stands on the podium to receive his medal. And they play the American national anthem. The Messiah fulfills what God gave Israel to do. The Messiah is the ideal Israelite. And it says in Isaiah 49 that the servant of the Lord, the Messiah, says, I've spent my strength for naught. In other words, Israel won't turn. Israel won't listen to me. And God says, no, I have more than that. It's not just that you are going to restore Israel, but you are going to be a light to all the nations. And it says in Isaiah 52, he will be highly exalted, but first he will suffer, and the nations of the world will listen to his voice. Not only that, the scripture declared after in the Xar, may Eretz Chaim, after he was cut off from the land of the living, that he would see the light of life. He'd be raised from the dead. It's an amazing thing that his followers in the first century all were willing to lay down their lives for him. Not because he died and was buried in some hopeless tomb, but because he rose from the dead. And it says in the Psalms that he will be exalted to the right hand of God and all the nations will be his inheritance. It has happened. The most awesome, impossible fulfillment to take place has happened and is happening in front of our eyes. As around the globe, people in China, people in Africa, by the hundreds of thousands, come to love and worship the God of Israel through Jesus. Now, why did the Messiah have to die? Please understand this. If you can grasp this, a light will go on. The Messiah was not just to be a king. If he was just to be a king, he'd come and set up his kingdom and we'd still be lost in our sins. We'd still be hopeless because the problem is on the inside of us. The problem is we have been alienated from God. We have broken his commandments. Every single one that's ever lived has broken the commandments of God outside of the Messiah. What happened was the Messiah was not just to be a king, but he was to be a priest. David was an example of a royal priest. He was king, but he also performed priestly functions. And the Bible says his sons were kohanim. His sons were priests. An amazing thing. Why is this important? Because the priest's role was to make atonement for the sins of the people. And the Messiah came as the ideal high priest and laid his life down as a ransom for the sins of mankind. He had to do that. If he was not a priest, he could not bring salvation. He could not bring reconciliation. He could not bring us a new heart. He could not bring us cleanness of mind and soul. You say, well, the idea of the Messiah dying for our sins, isn't that wrong? No, do you know that the Talmud teaches, mitatan sadikim techaper, the death of the righteous makes atonement? Do you know that the Talmud even teaches that when the high priest would die, that his death served as an atonement for the murderer who was in exile, and he would then be free from exile? It's found in Makot 11b. These are things that are inherent in Jewish tradition. And in a wonderful prophecy in the book of Zechariah, there's a man named Yehoshua, who was also called Yeshua over 25 times in the Hebrew Bible. Yeshua, Jesus, in the Hebrew Bible. And you know what it says about him? This man, Yehoshua, who was a priest, is a symbol of the Messiah, a symbol of the one who is called the branch, which is universally recognized by the rabbis as a messianic title. And you know what it says about him? That he will sit as a priest ruling on his throne, the Mashiach, not just a king, but the priest 
offering himself for our sins, the ideal righteous one saying, God, may the sins of the world fall on me. May I be the ideal sacrifice that the law and the prophets point to. And it says in the prophet Isaiah, Uva chavarato near palanu. And by his wounds we are healed. I experienced it personally. Jews around the world, the chief rabbi of Bulgaria in the last generation, Rabbi Daniel Tzion, he experienced the love of God in Jesus the Messiah and was wonderfully transformed and won many other Jews to the truth. And I'd encourage you to do what the psalmist said, Ta'amu ru'u kitov Adonai, taste and see that the Lord is good. The Messiah came to the place he was supposed to come. He came before the second temple was destroyed. And friends, if he's not the Messiah, we have no Messiah because he had to come and fulfill his mission before the second temple was destroyed. And Jewish tradition preserved in the Talmud tells us that for the last 40 years before the temple was destroyed, God no longer accepted the Jewish sacrifices on the Day of Atonement. Why? Because the ideal sacrifice had been made. Since that time, there have been no more sacrifices that can be offered at the temple. Since that time, the temple has still not been rebuilt. If Jesus is not the Messiah, then we will never have a Messiah because he had to come before the destruction of the second temple. He had to die. He had to rise from the dead. He had to be rejected by his people. And the knowledge of Messiah has to go around the world. And then the wonderful day will come when the Jewish people, according to the prophet Zechariah, will look back to him. It says, They will look to me, God says, whom they have pierced. The Jewish people will recognize, my God, the one that we thought was the cause of all of our suffering, the one that we so rejected and misunderstood, he was actually our Messiah and King. And when they welcome him back with the words, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. At that point, he will return and establish his kingdom. And all the other prophecies that you read about in this literature, that's when they'll be fulfilled. We have the definite proof that he has done everything he had to do up to now. Therefore, I'm confident he'll do the rest. Those who reject him are still waiting, still hoping, still wondering. The Talmud says that if we are worthy, the Messiah will come on the clouds of heaven. If we're not worthy, he'll come meek and lowly riding on a donkey. They missed it, friends. It's not either or. The prophet said he will come riding meek and lowly on a donkey, and he did. And the prophet said he will come in the clouds of heaven, and he will. He did the first. He will do the rest. I am sure. And if you'll open your hearts, I believe the word of God will become clear to you. And Jesus said, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free.